Hi everyone and uh, good afternoon, good evening to most of you. Um, a very warm welcome to uh, today's session uh, where we are going to be focusing on sustainability and marketing. Um, so um, just to share that we will actually make a copy of this presentation available to you um, after the session, so no need for copious notes. Um, so today we're going to be exploring some of the gaps that exist uh, in in this uh, in this area and and looking to on how to uh, address them. So we'll be focusing uh, specifically on Asia Pacific or having a focus on Asia Pacific today. And uh, we have two more sessions uh, later on today focused uh, on uh, EMEA and uh, the Americas as well. So, uh, and to help us on this journey, I'm joined by an excellent lineup today. Uh, so, my colleague Joanna Dinner, who's the uh, insights manager at WFA, uh, and uh, followed by she'll be followed by um, Scott Young, um, one of our partners on this project, uh, who brings his uh, behavioural science knowledge and insight to bear in terms of understanding how we can address some of the gaps that Joanna will share with you and how marketing can be part of the solution. And then finally, he will be followed by the excellent Rupin Desai, who many of you will know uh, is the Global Chief Marketing Officer of Dole Foods. Uh, and we will have plenty of opportunity uh, for questions uh, as we go through. So please, whenever a question does occur, feel free to post it in the Q&A widget that you should be seeing uh, at the bottom of your screen. And we'll allow plenty of time for discussion and questions, especially from Rupin and Scott, but also from the WFA team, uh, if you wish. Uh, so, uh, for the few of you on here who are new to the WFA, uh, you will probably not know that WFA was founded in 1953 as a network of national associations. And I think we were six national associations then, including uh, the Indian, uh, Indian Society of Advertisers, uh, who I think are joining today. So, welcome to you. But we're proud to now have 60 uh, associations around the world, which provides us with that global footprint that you saw in addition to now 130 uh, corporate members. So that's the brand owner organizations only. And you can see the two types uh, of members here in front of you. Um, a very warm welcome to uh, all of you. I see some colleagues from Credit Suisse and elsewhere on there. I'm really pleased you could join us today. Now, onto the topic, I coincidentally came across this ad in campaign. I don't know if you saw this recently. It's a pretty bizarre, sort of extreme example um, the advertiser, who's now actually part of um, Exxon Mobil, uh, in 1962, was strangely bragging about their potential to melt glaciers. So, so dark humour. But um, suffice to say, uh, I think sustainability has not always been top priority um, for marketers. In fact, marketers marketing has often been seen as um, part of the problem. So, why sustainability uh, and why now? Um, well, I don't need to tell you that we've had campaigners and young and old who've opened many people's eyes to the climate uh, emergency and and just as an aside you you know you're, you're feeling old when actually baby-faced Leonardo DiCaprio starts to look old as well but you know so that's not the point of this slide um but I just just struck me looking at him anyway um but uh, so more recently we've had the likes of um BlackRock CEO Larry Fink telling companies that to prosper over time, every company must not only deliver financial performance, but also show how it can make a positive contribution to society. So uh, this matters to people, matters to investors, therefore to the business. And looking spe more specifically um, to uh, our industry, you may remember uh, the Extinction Rebellion protesting uh, during the Cannes Lions last time we met uh, in 2019, uh, demanding that we be part of the solution, not the enemy uh, of a, a sustainable future. And I think it's fair to say that during the Cannes Lions session uh, 2019, when we spoke to the marketers and the CMOs there, most really sustainability wasn't high on their agendas. And when we asked questions, very few actually felt confident to, to respond uh, and share on that, perhaps a handful of exceptions. And last year during our Marketer of the Future project, which some of you uh, may remember, uh, when we asked the 683 uh, mark senior marketers around the world um, where their roles were focused, um, sustainability was actually bottom of the list that we put forward to them, or second from bottom, I should say. Um, but then when we asked them to look uh, five years uh, ahead, so uh, 2023, um, what you see is actually sustainability leaps uh, to the top of the pile. 
Um, so what we did was we were looking around for insight and research around marketing and sustainability and actually found none. Uh, there's a lot of excellent work that's been done in relation to sustainability and consumers. And of course, I'm sure all your organizations are consumer centric um, and, and that's incredibly important, but not in relation to our industry. So that's why we spoke to these fine chief marketers, including Rupin, who you're going to hear from uh, later today, um, to really uh, get their understanding to help inform this project uh, that we're working on. And I think it's fair to say that many were very different stages of the sustainability maturity curve, if you like. Um, some were taking their first steps uh, in this area, uh, but others um, like Peter Wright is actually now just recently the former CMO of IKEA, but others um, more advanced in this area. And I think how he puts it, if you're a brand then communicating around sustainability is the least you have to do. Um, if you're not, then essentially you're not a brand, you're a commodity. So pretty strong words, but and a lot of passion, which has really helped us to inform uh, our approach. So we set out on the largest research project WFA had undertaken at that time. We had 34 uh, national advertiser associations take part and um i'm sure i will miss some but uh, several from um from asia pacific including uh, australia uh, china japan uh, india to name to name a few and and, and, and maa in malaysia um, and we we're able to deliver a global first in sustainability and marketing research focused specifically on the budget holders so the client side marketers like you um, so uh, before I hand over to Ioana, um, I, I think the starting point for us is when we went into this research, we thought we were probably going to see a disconnect between um, between consumers, between people uh, and between brand owners, as we had in some projects in the past. But actually, what we found was the opposite was to be true. Uh, so when comparing our data to the likes of work from from Nielsen, for example, as I think the example is here, we see that actually marketers and consumers are quite aligned that brands can and should make a difference when it comes to sustainability, which is an encouraging start. But as you will see, there's work to be done. Um, now, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Ioana, uh, to share a little bit more in depth on what this study taught us overall, and then with a bit of a focus as well, as I mentioned, on Asia Pacific. So, hello. Good morning, Joanna. I won't pretend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for the context and for the intro. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to, to be sharing some, uh, some good news with you um, and some realistic news. Uh, and then we'll invite Scott to, to and of course, uh, Rupin to, to share on how we can close these gaps. But first of all, I would like to, uh, to start with some positive news. We asked our sample that Rob mentioned before, uh, on a corporate level, how are they placed on a maturity journey uh, in terms of sustainability? And we found out uh, two thirds of our samples felt that their organizations are progressing well or already being well advanced, which is a good news to start with. Uh, however, when we asked at the marketing level, we've identified a gap between how marketing function is progressing. And we, we thought maybe because of the consumption conundrum, because as we know, marketing function is mostly seen as a driver of consumption, which sometimes can clash with the sustainability agenda. And even more, we, we deep dive into different types of gaps between marketing function and sustainability. And we identified three major ones that I would like to share. First, at an organizational level, uh, some we might know as you as brand owners, um, sustainability doesn't usually fit well in uh, existing uh, structures. Sometimes there is a lack of dedicated resources. And even if there is a dedicated resource available, it, it, it's very common that the efforts are being done in parallel with marketing. Secondly, there is a capability gap and simply said, marketers today feel that they are lacking the knowledge uh, in the sustainability space. And finally, a measurement gap. Although many of the companies we interviewed said that they are measuring efforts, so there is a multitude of KPIs available, there is still a market, uh, a lack of market, uh, uh, industry consensus in terms of, of what good looks like. That makes it very difficult for marketers to measure progress in this, uh, in this journey. 
And to add to this challenge, we also have noticed um, from available consumer research that I'm quoting here from Latana, from uh, a, a big project that they are doing called Sustainability Perception Index uh, with consumers around 20 markets around the world. We, we noticed that sustainability simply means different things for different people. For example, if we look at Brazil, it's mostly deforestation. These are real relevant topics uh, for the people uh, in this market. However, in India, it's more about water usage and how, how this can be reduced in production uh, processes. And China is obviously uh, focusing more on pollution of air and water. And even more, we've seen that the, the understanding of sustainability and the priorities in this space differ for marketers. We've seen that um, the United Nations Sustainability Deve Development Goals are United fight Factor, uh, with 80% of the companies referring to this framework already, which is good news. However, um, the priorities are differing. Uh, so we've seen, for example, in North America, as you see in the slide, North America and uh, Middle East and Africa focus more on gender equality, while Europe and Brazil, for example, put the climate action goal as, as a key focus. And what I found interesting um, is that APAC marketers we interviewed indicated that the goal three, referring to good health and well being, is more relevant for the region. So, with this in mind, we also look, uh, wanted to see how uh, market level uh, progress is being done. Keep in mind that these are self assessments, but However, it's not probably a surprise with, to see Sweden leading on top of the, on the progress curve. However, it's interesting to notice that two of the world's largest economies in red here, US, India, and even China, they are indicating rather modest progress in, in, uh, in the sustainability prog uh, journey. And now I would like to focus a little bit on uh, what I like to call my favorite part of the world. Um, APAC has been seen um, as a, a region that shows a lot of enthusiasm. However, the marketers we interviewed are indicating that there is still a little bit of progress uh, to be made in the area. As you can see on the right uh, chart, APAC average uh, score or 3.5 out of five maximum. Um, behind the global average. Despite India and China, two of the strongest um, uh, markets we had represented in this uh, sample being slightly above the regional uh, curve. So there is a lot to, uh, to be done. And I will take a little bit of your time to share some of this multitude of insights we've came across. Um, so at at APAC regional level, we I want you to remember three things from, uh, from what we've learned. First, and this shouldn't come as a news for anyone, the pandemic has notably accelerated business involvement in society issues. And two, there is still a lack of literacy that is making the journey a bit more difficult in this region for the marketers. But however, despite this, this challenge, there is a, an appetite to catch up, to bring more dedicated resources, like a, a chief sustainability officer. And here I would like to take uh, the, the opportunity to make a, a parallel with how chief, develop, uh, chief digital officers contributed to the digital transformation a while ago. So we can optimistically look at uh, bringing CSOs in, in organizations and potentially a Kickstarter of, of this journey. And finally, before I hand over to, to Scott, I wanted to, to, to share a bit of market focus and two powerful examples from this region. First, from China, we have an universal agreement you can see in the red chart um, that indeed the pandemic has accelerated the, the business's involvement in what is societal issues. And as, as we've seen as as the rest of the region, they are still struggling with a lack of literacy. However, China, Chinese marketers identified this is a bigger, bigger gap than the rest of APAC region and the uh, rest of the marketers around the world. And on the other hand, India, um, the, the Indian marketers we've interviewed are indicating that they're still not measuring efforts, but with, with the intention of starting soon. And then Another challenge that is specific for this market was 
the efforts are not aligned internally with marketing and other functions in the organization. So with this being said, I'm happy to welcome you, uh, Scott, who will talk to us about um, closing some of these gaps and how behavioral science can, can bring that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Joanna. It's really great to, to be here. And it's really been a pleasure to, uh, to work with you and Rob and the WFA team uh, on, this, on this project, on this initiative. Um, in my few minutes with you, um, I thought I'd take a step back and, and do my best to summarize what I thought we heard um, in just three slides or so, and then to speak in a little more depth about an opportunity that, that we think emerged from this and, and an area that I feel very passionately about uh, tied to um, helping consumers change their own behaviors and act more sustainably. Um, but I'll start off with where we started. Uh, you, as, as Rob mentioned, you know, the subtitle of the report was Closing the Gaps. And really that came from the idea that we saw three levels of gaps really in parallel. Um, the one between what consumers were expecting and hoping for from brands and how they perceive what brands are doing with respect to sustainability. And I would emphasize that, that idea of perception. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, secondly, between what organizations are indeed doing, or again, what they perceive they're doing, but what the marketing teams are communicating. And uh, that speaks to uh, the, uh, the idea that was presented earlier about marketing, perhaps lagging organizations uh, with respect to sustainability. And then, you know, ultimately perhaps the biggest idea, the potential power uh, that, that you have on the marketing and the brand side to make a difference again, particularly related to, to this area that I'll dive a little deeper into. So we have these gaps that are out there. Um, and the, you know, I think the obvious question that comes out of it is, well, what, what's holding marketers back in this area? And, and here, I think, again, we see perhaps three levels, um, which uh, Joanna spoke to or mentioned earlier. First, the, the idea of structural issues uh, within organizations. You know, the connection between sustainability efforts and marketing efforts, um, does that link to ownership and a sense of responsibility and accountability on the side? So certainly there are internal issues around that that need to be addressed. Um, secondly, measurement. Uh, again, Joanna mentioned um, measurement is not quite there, both in terms of perhaps linking uh, marketing communication or sustainability communication um, to measurement of marketing's efforts, but also this larger issue of um, alignment across the sector, across, across the world in terms of what does good look like? Um, do we have consistent standards, metrics, et cetera, and a consistent language that we can use? But then I think what st stood out really um, was this idea of confidence, um, or perhaps if you think of it the other way, a potentially a fear or concern about speaking about sustainability, um, a perceived lack of knowledge um, from marketers you know, about what is an admittedly a very complex and very broad issue. Um, and perhaps a fear that if they do speak out, um, they'll be accused of greenwashing or that perhaps they'll uh, lead to other challenges or problems or concerns. Um, so again, I think all of these contribute and perhaps they're interrelated in some way but ultimately this idea of confidence is an important one as well. Um, so you know, I think this leads to, to the third slide here, which is, well, what, what needs to change um, for us to take a, a major step forward as advertisers, as marketers? And again, I, I think it's not one solution, but perhaps a set of interrelated issues and, and, and changes. Um, certainly, I, I think no one would argue that there is a need for more education of marketers to help them feel confident um, in speaking up. Um, and, and of course, in parallel, we need to bring consumers along the way. And we can talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but I do think it's important to emphasize that this isn't just about education per se. I think the education needs to be combined with two different things. One, um, greater knowledge sharing and or inspiration um, across the marketing spectrum, because certainly there are organizations that are much further along in the journey. Um, and I think there is a willingness and an openness to potentially share examples and to share metrics and so forth. 
but we need to make sure that that happens. Um, and again, as I, I alluded to a moment ago, I think ultimately this needs to come around into a common language and a common set of KPIs that marketers understand and feel comfortable speaking about, and ultimately that uh, consumers uh, start to understand more so that when claims are made, folks know what that means. And, and again, there's, there's a validity there. But what I'd like to spend the rest of my time with you on is this, this bottom piece, which is I think there's really an opportunity given how broadly um, sustainability can be defined and, and how, how widely it's defined in different regions to for marketers to really take a step forward and proactively define sustainability, what it means to them and their organization and what it can mean to consumers. Um, and again, to really engage with them in, in a way that perhaps isn't happening today. And I think the opportunity here, just to share a few quick slides with you, um, came from some of this research that we found um, as background as we were, as we were approaching the study. Um, and what, what it shows you in a nutshell is that there's an awful lot of people out there that want to live more sustainably. And you see that's very well defined, particularly as you get younger, um, folks who have active intent to live more sustainably and change their habits um, to reduce impact. But importantly, they don't really see brands and marketers as their partners in this journey. In fact, you can see here more folks say that brands actually make it harder for them to, to live sustainably and to be environmentally friendly than those who feel that brands are making it easier. And what you see on the right here is actually an excerpt from the report. So I won't read it to you, but you can see um, really what we see here is a missed opportunity. Folks would like to live more sustainably, but they don't see their brands as, uh, as an ally. And, and certainly that means they're not living more sustainably. So there's a missed opportunity for the planet, but also um, for brands to really connect with people in a different way. So I think if I'm gonna put it in one sentence, we think there's a real opportunity sitting out there for brands to help consumers live more sustainably. Now, how does that happen? Well, I think the first step is taking this big, big, broad word of sustainability and defining it more narrowly and defining it in a way that's relevant to you as an individual brand. Um, so you see many examples here, but, but I think the important commonality is that they're pretty tangible, specific actions. Because uh, when we use the word sustainability, that's a broad word that, that isn't frankly very actionable. But when we start talking about shorter showers or reusable shopping bags, suddenly we have a specific action um, that people can understand and that hopefully we can help people move towards. Um, so how do we, you know, how do we start defining things? Well, I would say the UN Sustainable Development Goals can serve as a starting point. Um, and, and here I'm sharing an example um, from, from Reckitt, you know, which essentially aligns its brands with different goals. So saying, you know, what's the most relevant goal for Lysol? What's the most relevant goal for Vanish and for Finish? And, and as you see, they end up in different places. Um, but this at least gives you a starting point to potentially say, you know, again, sustainability is extremely broad, but we can pick one area that we think is relevant to us. And perhaps that can be a unifying idea for us globally, even if we act um, in different ways in different regions or countries in terms of very specific actions and, and initiatives. Um, and here, I won't read these through to you in the interest of time, but you can start to see a few questions uh, to dive a little bit deeper. You know, again, the UN goals might be a starting point and perhaps a global unifier, but we also have to ask ourselves some of these other questions around you know, what's salient in my region is there an unmet goal that my consumers have around their lives and, and how they'd like to live more sustainably? And ultimately, can we find some of these win-win-win behavior changes, right? Where we see a change in behavior that is uh, positive for society and for consumers and for us. And there's nothing wrong that there might be uh, with potentially a positive um, for ourselves if it means saving, uh, saving costs, for example, as we save um, resources and help society. 
Um, and, and just the last final slide or two, I'd say that, you know, in addition um, to thinking this way, I, I think it also in, means embracing a perhaps a, a more complementary way of thinking. Um, it's not just about advertising campaigns. Certainly there's a role for campaigns, um, but a lot of behavior change is not about informing or convincing or persuading people, which is perhaps the model we're most comfortable or familiar with. It's not just about giving them more information because in many cases, they already have the intent. They already know that they should do something. They'd already like to do it. So really the mindset has to shift towards making it easier for people to do things. And that's really where behavioral science comes into play. Um, and we think in terms of some of these ideas about removing the small hassles um, and difficulties that might be getting in their way of doing something, uh, doing a behavior change that they'd like to do. Uh, we think a lot about sending the right reminder, not lecturing people, not educating them further, but just reminding them at exactly the right moment uh, to take this step and to take this action. And as well, making it fun, uh, making it social if we can. Um, and again, making it quite visible for people. Um, so uh, again, there's certainly a role for more traditional advertising for informing people, but we need to go the next level as well. And finally, I just say, you know, if you're looking for inspiration, certainly a lot of it comes from Europe, um, which is leading the way here. Um, and, and this is an initiative that you can look up um, where we're essentially trying to help um, and encourage and reward brands for using some of these nudge techniques and behavioral science um, for good. But I would also emphasize that there are more and more examples coming from APAC as well. Um, whether it's you know, giving people the opportunity to offset, um, um, offset their actions you know, and minimize carbon footprint as you see here with ride sharing um, and grab, or whether it's um, allowing them to opt out um, you know, from, uh, from utensils and, and from other, other things um, and essentially minimize waste and, and, and unnecessary consumption. So I do think, you know, if you scratch the surface, you'll see more and more opportunities um, in the region. And really it's, it's a question of brands finding uh, what matters to them and finding a way to define sustainability. And I would just conclude, um, you know, again, by, by emphasizing that this isn't the full answer to the problem, certainly. There's a lot of things that have to happen, but I do think it's a very tangible opportunity um, for brands and marketers to move forward. So thank you. And with that, I think I'll turn this back to Rob um, and, and ultimately to Ruben. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. Really interesting. And I think obviously behavior um, change is going to be absolutely critical here so i'm going to ask you to come back in a minute um uh for when we have uh the questions and we're going to hear some more sort of asia focused examples as well from um from rupin but uh before we do um i just wanted to uh um come bring you back to a theme that we kept hearing during this research which i think is quite eloquently put by uh connie brahms who's the global chief digital marketing officer of unilever and um, basically saying that uh, yes, as, as Joanna said, there's lots of di uh, synergies with um, digital transformations that many of you have been through. But actually, the difference here is this is a problem for all of us, for the whole planet, not just for individual um, companies. So as Connie put it, this isn't something to compete on, but something that we need to work together on to ensure marketing becomes a part of the solution for our part as WFA. That's why we've worked together to create um, the Planet Pledge. Um, and I should, for information at the top right there, you can see a URL, uh, which is uh, where you can find more information about the pledge. And also, um, if you choose to, to download uh, the research that we've talked to you about now. But, um, but I'm going to uh, just uh, share a quick video with you to explain the pledge. In May 1927, the 15 millionth Model T came out of the plant. A large injection molding machine turns out all the parts needed to meet the customer's demands for service. From the eye appeal and swift effectiveness of the smallest utensils
Now, I have to uh, turn my video off and that's playing because I find myself nodding like an idiot. <laughs> I love that music. Um, but uh, yeah, just to uh, explain in terms of the uh, commitment areas for the Planet Pledge. So um, firstly, this is about commitment uh, for your organization. This tends to be the biggest hurdle for a lot of companies who are not there already is to join the United Nations Race to Zero, uh, which is uh, which is uh, I can share more information on that with you. But this is essentially the key uh uh, project, if you like, in the game that brings together lots of different initiatives um, and, and also to encourage your supply chain, so your agency partners uh, to do the same. Uh, the second, and Joanna talked to this quite a bit, uh, is about the to, uh, scaling knowledge. Um, so by providing tools and guidance uh, to help uh, empower your teams, because there's a lot of enthusiasm around sustainability, but what you often tend to see is that the greenwashing examples that happen um, aren't down to any malicious intent, but they're literally down to a lack of misunderstanding. So it can be a complex area that requires uh, education, just as we did with digital transformations. And thirdly, uh, is around um, harnessing the power of marketing communication. So it's not about sort of setting specific targets right now for behavior change, but it's around inspiring one another. So bringing CMOs together to learn from uh, each other's best practice and, and also mistakes along the way. And finally, uh, is about engendering trust uh, amongst consumers um, to uh, through substantiated claims, so based on guidance and knowledge rather than simply on enthusiasm. So all obviously interrelated. Um, and, uh, and again, you can see the URL if you want to dig into that in more detail or, or in fact join. And happily, the efforts of what we've been focusing on have been recognized by none other than Sir David Attenborough. Um, <laughs> almost deity isn't he but um he presented during our global market week uh, and also nigel topping who you see here uh if you don't know him you're probably going to be hearing a lot more about him soon he's one of the two uh, high level climate champions for cop 26 uh, which will be meeting in glasgow uh, in the uk uh, in november um, and as you can see in his quote here, he's calling on chief marketing officers to be the climate activists and lead the way to the race to zero. And I should mention David Attenborough, his uh, quite famous quote now is saying that um, sustainability is now a communications issue. So people are looking for our industry, for our creativity uh, to actually be part of the solution. And I could honestly say that through doing this, we've actually seen some um, witnessed conversations being triggered internally by uh, chief marketing officers you know, asking reaching out to the chief sustainability officer for the first time reaching out to ceos asking about rates to zero why are they not involved how can they get involved so momentum um, is building and happily um, these excellent companies uh, that you see here have already stepped up to the plate uh, if you like uh, and taken the pledge uh, to join us on this journey uh, to ensure marketing becomes part of the solution uh, and we welcome more companies to join so please do um, get in touch if you want to find out more but for now uh, we're very proud uh, to welcome uh, one of the founding signatories uh, to the pledge, um, Rupin uh, Desai. Uh, he, as I mentioned before, he's a global chief marketing officer of Dole Foods. He also is a very good friend of the WFA uh, and wanted to say uh, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, join us uh, again today, Rupin. Always so um, generous with, with your time and your knowledge. So great to have you back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, uh, so we were, we were one of the first signatories of the Planet Pledge. And in fact, we made pledges of our own as a company exactly a year ago, right at the start of the pandemic. And the reason we did that was, was a recognition that people, planet and prosperity are far more interlinked and far more dependent than business has ever recognized in the past. Most of our businesses have been built where one of them can usually profit, uh, cloaking itself as prosperity, but profit has come at the cost of either people or the planet. And, and just to give you a much more tangible uh, insight into this, I'll, I'll, I'll dwell into our land, which is the land of the fruit. And you see, every time we waste fruit, and we are a generation that has grown up to judge how good a fruit's nutrition is based on its appearance. But every time fruit is wasted, 
a waste lands up in landfills, which creates methane. That food could have gone to be upcycled into new products that could have contributed to nutrition for a whole host of people that are living with malnutrition today, about one third of the world's population. Had we learned how to not waste food, we would have landed up with better shareholder return, leading to better financial return for farmers, which could have led to more fruit and more nutrition for us. Uh, and as you dwell into your own business, you will learn the first thing that I want to talk about out of the four things I want to share, which is that when you talk about sustainability, when you talk about purpose, when you talk about even CSR or any of those wonderful changes you want to bring to the business, it has to be baked into the business model. It has to be baked into the business model, taking into consideration that people, planet and prosperity all need to thrive together rather than at the cost of each other. We found our inspiration in a 150 year old Japanese belief called Sampo Yoshi, which says business performs best when it's great for the buyer, great for the seller and great for society. Our 21st century version of that is people performs best when people, planet and prosperity all thrive together. So as each one of you start or put more momentum in your own journeys towards sustainability, the one learning I could share is take a look at your business model. Take a look at what you are scaling for prosperity. And unless you can make good of the people, communities, society, good for the planet into what you scale as a business, the change you bring will be extremely, it'll be like the right, it'll be like the right hand side tab of the CSR button, which would be the first thing that will get cut unless it is baked into the business. The second thing we learned when we launched our own pledges and that with WFA, the planet pledge is it's absolutely okay not to have all the answers. Now, this is not how business operates usually. Uh, we research and research and research. We go level after level after level of bureaucracy all the way down to the board to convince everybody that we know the answers. When we launched our six promises to the world, promises like we wanted to get out of single-use plastic by 2025, even till today, we don't have a solution yet. And it is absolutely okay for all businesses to make a pledge, to make a promise without having sight of all the solutions. As you look around, whether there are collaborations and there is one that is trying to find its way out of single-use plastic between Diageo, Unilever, Coca-Cola and others. There are experiments we're doing with a whole host of other technology partners or We've gone ahead and launched a $2 million idea fund. If there is somebody out there, one person, one startup, two people, a full-fledged company, for-profit, not-for-profit, who has a good idea, then that collaboration is the new ecosystem of tomorrow. But I think this is one of the biggest barriers that prevents a lot of companies to go out and make uh, pledges to go out and want to have a better world. And, and what I can share with you from our experience at Dole is it's absolutely okay to have the right intent and even if necessary, fail and be open about failing rather than not trying at all. The third thing we've learned is it is all about actions, not advertising. A lot of marketeers who are listening to me please avoid the urge to try and make a three minute film about what you're doing. Please avoid the urge to use that as woke washing or green washing. And as Scott spoke about before, let's make this about actions, whether they are small nudges, whether they are substantive promises and everything in the middle, because the worst thing we could be doing to our children and the future is to try and and, and greenwash our inability to leave a better planet for them. And the fourth point in conclusion, 
is we are living through, have lived through the pandemic, which has left people far more poorer, far more starving, a lot more waste, a lot more single-use plastic, and a lot more carbon than ever before. And each and every one of us as an individual or a father or a mother or a responsible business person needs to ask ourselves the question, if you are not yet making a pledge, changing your business model for the good, then what the hell are we waiting for? So in summary, the four things that we learned, and even though I've just shared that we shouldn't show advertising and show actions, I'm going to use a film that we released a year ago when we made the promises at Dole with these four points as what we learned at Dole as we made these promises for ourselves and then with WFA as part of the Planet Pledge. Dear leaders of the world, I've watched the world change a lot over the past few months. The skies are bluer. We're eating healthier. Even the animals seem happier. So, why isn't it like this all the time? Why do we need to cut down so many trees without planting new ones? The oxygen helps clean up smoky factories. Why do we keep using plastic? We're poisoning the water and the fish we eat. Why do we add more sugar to food that's already sweet? All it does is make us unhealthy. And why don't we do more for hungry children? All the food we waste could help feed them. It's really simple. When we treat the planet better, everyone and everything gets better. And if you, the leaders of the world, can't get it right, then it's time for me to step up and do something about it. Sincerely, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share some of our learnings uh, uh, and hope that they help each and every one of you as you begin the journey, either as a signatory or a, about to be a signatory of the WFA plan. Thank you. That's fantastic, Rup, and inspiring stuff and, and uh, leading from the front as ever. I am going to ask Scott now to um, turn on his camera and join us. We have a couple of questions that have come through. I just shared uh, this slide up here. So if any of you who want to reach out directly um, to us, uh, please do so. Um, I'll let Rupin decide if he wants to share his details later. I didn't think he'd want to be inundated with emails. Um, but uh, a, a few questions here that we've got time for, and um, one which uh, actually I was hoping to ask as well. So great minds think alike. Um, the question's for Rupin, but I think um, welcome for anyone else who, uh, uh, who'd like to answer. How do you demonstrate that sustainability really is good for business? So uh, um, how can you measure the uplift and how do you demonstrate that to management so we hear a lot of cmos saying it, it feels like an either or um how, how do you how do you get around that maybe start with you rupin if you're okay yeah, and I'll, I'll i'll go back to the point i was trying to make that unless good is baked into your business model it'll all, always become an either or question and it'll always be the budget that gets cut first when you're having a bad quarter and, and let me give you an example. If, if you're in the business of selling sugary water, and I think yesterday's news of a famous footballer, and if you haven't seen this video, I strongly <laughs> recommend you to, took away the two bottles of the sugary water at a press conference and put his own bottle of water and said, please drink more water. Yeah. Now, so if you're in the business of selling sugary water and that's what you scale, and that's what you measure as success, it's a bit difficult to measure yourself on any good you would be doing to communities out there. But if good is baked into, and therefore moving to zero sugar, or moving away from plastic as you scale the sell of whatever water you decide to sell, 
for success, it becomes extremely difficult and an either or question. So my, the only way to do this is to bake some amount of good, large amount of to what you Okay, broke up just at the end there, but but thank you. I, 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 well, we had a CMO forum recently, and actually a couple of those companies were talking about that and saying that actually if it's not possible to do to your whole organization, start with a couple of brands, start with X percent of your budget to actually prove those case studies, and that's an opportunity to then scale across your business as a whole. Scott, anything to – your passion for measurement, uh, Any anything that uh, you'd like to share on that? No, I, I certainly agree with, with what was said. And, and again, I think the challenge is defining the good that you can do that, that makes sense for your brand. And, and certainly it's perhaps a little less obvious in some areas and some brands than others, but I, I think there's an opportunity, you know, no matter what you're doing, whether it is recycling or reducing plastic usage or helping people um, uh, with food waste, as an example, I, I think those opportunities are out there and it's really a question of, of finding one that makes sense and committing to it and then communicating around it and actively helping people there. Terrific. Thank you. And um, Rupin, uh, you spotted this question directly for you. Love that video. So what can you do if you happen to be in the business of selling sugary water, as many WFA members are, does Dole have the advantage because you're in the business of fruit? Let me start with the second part first. So yes, we're extremely blessed because what we sell for a living is purposeful to begin with. We don't grow much. Mother Earth does an amazing job and we've got to make sure that we bring it in the most pristine natural form possible. Yeah, you'd be surprised even when you're in the business of selling fruit, the wonderful last hundred years, there are parts of the business that we would have screwed up. We did brought that, we continue to bring that fruit by some parts of the business adding processed sugar, some parts of the business selling it in single use plastic. And even when you are blessed with the business of fruit, <coughs> you can still continue to add damage to the planet, which is what we're undoing now. If you're in the business of selling sugary water, one obviously is the recognition that the world is becoming far more unhealthier than we've ever been, but also listening to consumers in the need for other options that satisfy the same needs, but also the way you bring sugary water may be leaving behind further damage apart from the sugary water itself, whether it's single use plastic, whether it's the amount of carbon, whether it's the amount of transportation, whether it is the, the, uh, so even if you're making money through sugary water, how you use that money after you've made that money, whether you do uh, 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 activities in education, in communication, there is a whole host of areas. And Scott spoke a whole host about nudging. Irrespective of whether your current way to scale business is unhealthy or bad for the planet, there are areas you can choose to either offset those or do better. Obviously, if like us, you are in the area where you can bring products in the more pristine form, it is always luckier to be in those businesses. And I do acknowledge that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to take a bit of a liberty here and, and merge uh, two questions together. But um, one was asking around, uh, so we talk, Ioana talked a little bit about um, chief digital officers and the synergies that we see with um, chief strategy officers uh, overall. So uh, the question here was, where does the CS, I don't know if you remember, Rupin, if you have a CSO within um, Dole Foods, but uh, where does the chief sustainability officer's role stop and where does the CMO's role begin or stop, if you like? So, I mean, let me start with the CMO's role, which probably is one of the most difficult one to try and paint on a piece of paper because it's you on a given day, you move from chief product officer to chief evangelist officer to, and forget the chief, you become a product manager, you become an evangelist manager, you become an orchestrator of campaigns, you are a, a crisis manager, you are a, a PR supporter, and so on and so forth. But 
a step back, the, the marketeer's role has been about being the consumer's voice in the company. Uh, and I think somewhere along the way, we have forgotten that fact uh, that we are the voice of the consumer, the same consumer who statistically is saying they expect more from companies, they expect companies to step up, they expect companies to partner with them on the sustainability journey. Now, each company will, will, will delineate CSO as compared to the CMO. At Dole, we, we don't, we have a CSO and his name is Obasan. And Obasan works as hand in glove with, with the rest of the organization, including me, because we have gone and spoken about the six things on how we want to conduct business. So the six promises were not promises for sustainability. They were not CSR for us. They were a change in our business model. This is how we want to conduct business moving forward. And therefore, they have forced a change in how we are structured, how we measure ourselves, how we are incentivized. And it is no longer, therefore, a sustainability set of actions or a marketing set of actions or a financial set of actions. These are the six promises that we hold the new company uh, that we're trying to, to, to pivot to. So it is much easier. I don't have a specific answer of where does the CSO's role stop and where does the CMO's role start or vice versa, just because, uh, just because there is no clear specific answer that is true for everyone around the world. Absolutely. I think it comes back to co-created and shared goals and metrics where actually it's about collaboration, not about someone handing over to another individual. Scott, we, we focus a little bit on the um, internal with these questions, but um, as brand owner organizations, it's often uh, often interesting area. Do you see in terms of uh, not just looking externally at um, your consumer and people, but uh, about internally, what's the role of behavioral science uh, in trying to bring your colleagues, your team, your culture, your organization along with you? Um, I don't know if that's a bit of a harsh question. <laughs> you took, gave some excellent examples of communications externally, but do you, any thoughts in terms of perhaps internal communication? Sure. No, uh, not a difficult one at all, because actually uh, a good number of the sustainability initiatives that we've been involved in have actually been internally focused. Um, I think a lot of organizations find that there is a demand and a desire among their own employees to live more sustainably. And I think they somewhat understandably realize that um, some nudging um, projects or efforts among their own employees, you know, whether it's uh, eating habits at their cafeteria or um, waste in, in, their, in their daily lives and in their, in their office environments, <laughs> Um, that those can be really powerful and visible. Um, they can be very positive in terms of um, helping people to think differently and making it tangibly internally as well. So, you know, if you're an organization with thousands of employees around the world, I'd say that's a great place to start uh, thinking about behavior change um, and to, um, again, uh, start getting people thinking in this way start testing and learning a little bit in terms of methods and then perhaps learning from that and then extending to external audiences and consumers. Fantastic. So certainly, I, I think starting with your own people uh, can be a great place, can be a terrific way to start a journey and, and to start thinking about very tangible, specific behavior changes tied to sustainability. Terrific. Uh, Thank you both. Uh, we we are up, up beyond time that I thought we would, but within the time that we promised uh, of our members. Um, so um, please uh, welcome any further questions via um, via email from um, anyone uh, who's on this call. If you could take the opportunity to just let us know uh, what you thought about it. Um, so thank you all for joining. Uh, thank you to my excellent colleague, Ioana. Um, in the interest of time, we didn't bring in into the Q&A. Sorry, Ioana, we will for the next one. <laughs> thank you, Scott, for being a terrific partner uh, and, and for your thank insight. You. And Rupin, uh, as always, I really appreciate your insight and, and, and passion on this area. So um, thank you very much to all of you for joining. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.